Hello again, everybody, and welcome to towards the end of 2021. And if you haven't really heard of two things this year being Ted Lasso or ransomware, you've probably really been living under a rock. Now, as much as I would love to talk about Ted Lasso with my guest, and I'm sure he would as well, we're probably going to be better off talking about the latter. So I have with me today the Chief Information Security Officer of Cohesity Incorporated, Brian Spanswick. And my name is Chris Colotti, Principal Architect here. And welcome to the show, Brian. We're going to have a good conversation here for about the next 20 minutes, right? Yeah, great. Chris, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. So the first topic we're going to hit on, we got about 20 minutes, we're going we're to hit on this first one is what you and I have called the changing evolution of ransomware. So everybody's familiar with it and we don't need to beat the dead horse that's been in the hallway for the last year, but it's evolved, right? And what we're seeing is bad actors are really starting to target not only production data, but also the backup copies. And, and there's, a, there's a particular definition that everybody's using out there from NIST, which is the definition of an air gap. And I'm sure you're familiar with it, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, if for the folks watching, you know, I'm going to read, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of it, but this defines an air gap as an interface between two systems which are not connected physically and any logical connection is not automated, meaning it's under, it's got to be under human control. So you and I talked about this when we prepped a little bit. And I, and I think what's really interesting is, is this even possible? Like, can we do what NIST defines as an air gap in today's world, in your opinion? Well, sure, it's possible, but it really adds a level of complexity to our connected world that we live in. So the reason that you're seeing folks talk about air gapping in different ways that's not necessarily consistent with the definition that you just read is they're trying to, I think they're trying to describe a level of security that gets you to that air gap definition without the inconvenience of air gapping. Um, I'm hearing terms out there like modern air gapping, logical air gapping. Um, and, and I think that's what they're trying to get across because air gapping itself Unless you're saving off to tape and putting it in Iron Mountain, there's really no other way to achieve it. And I, and I think I agree with you, right? And I think part of the challenge we've had is, is and I'm going to go out on a limb, is it seems like this is already becoming an overused term in its, in its ability to be realistic. Is that, a, is that a fair assessment? I think so. Again, I think with, I get salespeople all the time selling me new different controls and solutions. And I hear these terms and, and as a CISO listening to the listening to what they're describing, again, I think what they're trying to describe is the level of security, and they're taking a shortcut by saying air gapping. I think there's some terms that probably more accurately describe what they're getting at. That's more practical in this connected world that we live in. Now, things like a, a term like data isolation. Data isolation gives you a level of security that comes closer to air gapping. Um, without having to misrepresent what, what that what that control actually actually delivers. So let's dig into that a little bit because we, we talked about that in the past too. And uh, I, I think I, I want to go back to your statement that you said to me earlier, which is you want to be able to do more without the inconvenience of, you know, actually disconnecting your systems. So, you know, what are some of those examples that you've seen out there that, that are this I guess you could say more of an isolation than an air gap. Well, you and I will start using a different term going forward. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, there, there are solutions out there um, that do achieve this level of data isolation, where the only time that they're connecting is when they are updating their backups when they're getting the more recent snapshots. And then all other time, it is truly air gapped. But because of that level of connectivity, there is a, um, it, it doesn't fit the definition. And there's vulnerability at the, at the time that you're connected. There's other things that you can do that also start to isolate your data. Things like network segmentation. Um, it's not so much isolation, but it's protecting your data with encrypting your, your not just your production environments, but your backup. Um, those are things that, continue, that raise your security posture close to the level of air gapping, but with the reality of our situation where we need, to, we need those, those backups recent. We need quick access to them. We're going to need to be online with them as we go through our restore. So that's probably a more realistic or accurate description of the security posture we should be trying to achieve versus trying to change the term air gapping. And, and you you and I, again, we, we chatted about this earlier. There's a huge trade-off, right? So in, in, in the course of an event, if an event happens, obviously you need the fastest recovery is from having stuff on-prem, right? Having that data available on-premises. But when we get into this conversation of isolation, 
in, in separate copies, they may not be close by, they may be in the cloud somewhere, they may be someplace else. How do you really try to handle that, that trade-off and what is the trade-off? Yeah, the, the, the trade-off is real. And how you decide what the level of trade-off that you're willing to commit to has to do with, the, with your business situation and what the impact is by your speed to recover. So when you think about what we're trying to protect against, things like a ransomware attack, there, um, one way to minimize the potential impact of the bad actor is to just to keep them out or make it difficult for them to get in. But the other way to minimize the impact is to be able to cut, recover quickly from backup. So um, if you've got really aggressive recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives, and you've built the ability to recover and meet those objectives, recover your not just your systems, but your business processes, that's going to minimize the impact. But that requires more frequent backups. That requires more, um, uh, more interaction with your backup and storage uh, solutions. And so that's what we're talking about when we say um, the isolated data. The more times that you're you're moving, you're connecting to that data. The, those times you're vulnerable. So you've got to have a you've got to have a balance or a trade off of how aggressive do you get on your RT and R, RTO and RPO targets, um, but, and which allows you to back or to recover more quickly, but it creates a level of risk associated with the exposure you have to of those systems. And, and kind of the last question on this, this line of conversation, but where does immutability fit in for a CISO? Uh, well, it, it fits right into this, this whole data protection um, strategy. So one of the things that's, that's changing as we think, as we're thinking about our overall security posture, as opposed to individual controls, we're not assuming that all the protect controls are going to work. So immutability is another layer of protection that minimizes, maybe even can potentially eliminate the impact if they are able to breach the network. And so having data that is encrypted, that can't be changed, that can't be deleted, there's a level of comfort there. So early on when we were talking about the, the NIST definition of air gap, and I was making the statement that I think these folks are trying to get these concepts are trying to get closer to the, the security posture that that provides, immutability definitely figures into that data protection strategy. So let's flip the script a little bit to the, to the other problem that's kind of happening. And, and obviously all this is going to lead up to uh, to some new uh, products and features that Cohesity is putting out there. Um, but the latest problem is data exfiltration. Um, and, and I got to believe that that is on the mind of every CISO that, that you talk to. Hey, not only did they get in, not only did they encrypt stuff, but they actually stole the data and they're, they're, they're you know, this, it's kind of a twofold ransom effort. Um, but, it, it, you know, is there another meaning to it or is it is it literally that? Is it just is is the problem that they've gotten into the system and they've gotten unencrypted data and they've pulled it out? Is that really what the problem of data exfiltration is? Well, that's the definition of data exfiltration, right? Like we are in a situation here where we're trying to protect our data for a couple of reasons. One is in today's world, data is everything. It's how we it's how we run our business. We can't run the business without the data. The second part of that is making sure that our that our systems and processes are secure. And then there's a there's a secondary impact when our the data is exfiltrated. There's value of that with that data in the open market. And so there's additional motivations in addition to disrupting business operations for these attackers. And so that's why it's becoming such a bit such a hot topic. That's what you're seeing with some of these ransomware attacks. They are taking over or they are um, restricting operations from a system perspective, but they're also threatening to release the data. Um, there's significant there's significant impacts based on how much data they get and what kind of data and what kind of company they, they breached. And it's interesting because this this next question, I'm going to tee this up in a recent example of mine because, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you what your biggest concern is for, for data exfiltration. And your answer is going to key off of this because I know the answer and what it's going to be. Um, but I recently had, you know, four different debit cards. The numbers were stolen. But here's the interesting thing about that story. We've never actually used those debit cards anywhere. I actually can guarantee you that they've been sitting in a safe. We've never even taken the stickers off of them. So I actually reached out to the CISO of the bank and said, and I never haven't got a response back yet. I said, look, I can guarantee these cards haven't been used. And I believe you have an inside problem because these, were, these could not have been swipe captured, right? They've yeah. never left the, they went from envelope to safe. What is really your biggest fear for data exfiltration. Yeah, and beautiful setup, by the way. 
<laughs> my, my, it's a scary, my by the way, that's a scary <laughs> scenario to see all these things download and say, we didn't use these cards. We've never used these cards. For sure. Um, uh, my biggest fear around data, data exfiltration is insider threat. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we've all got malicious actors inside of our organization that's trying to find ways to steal data from us. Um, there, there may be some of that, but I, I believe that that's probably corner cases. Uh, the real issue is people with good intentions just not having good security data management hygiene. You know, situations where somebody wants to, is going to is going to work on something over the weekend, so they download some customer files to their laptop, they leave it at a Starbucks. Those things are so such commonplace. And um, that's that's the real the real danger um, is those kinds of th that kind of behavior. And that's not new behavior, though. I mean, I, I think back and uh, to when I was a boy as a system admin and, you know, we were we started moving away from desktops to laptops and we had, you know, executive level people yeah. who had laptops. That's always kind of gone on, though, in a sense, hasn't it? Like that well, particular, hey, I'm going to go work from home when it wasn't the world we're in today and it was an exception sure. rather than the rule. Yeah, well, think about the the difference in motivation, though, from when we were kids to now. Um, if you would have let, if, if there was a Starbucks and you left your computer in a Starbucks, although for me it was a, an Apple IIe, it would be too big to be leaving in a in a Starbucks. But but if I would have done that, what they wanted, what the value was of it for, from a thief, they wanted the hardware, they wanted the machine, they didn't care about they didn't care about the the yeah they were going to wipe they didn't it understand. and resell it. Yeah, when, when when we were young, the idea that something would have that an idea or a thought or data would have value separate from the physical thing didn't exist. Like nobody thought there'd be music without a record. There, you know, and now everybody understands, even if they just are watching CNN, that data has value. And so there, there's a different motivation for somebody to grab that bag at Starbucks than there was if there was an equivalent well, and it's, when I was a kid. Especially if that bag's got a logo on it or, you know, like think of, you know, I'm, I'm, we could go off on a tangent on this one, which I don't want to do. But I mean, we see that all the time, right? People are walking around Silicon Valley or, or anywhere in the Valley and you've got different companies with different names on it and everybody's got their bag. And anybody who's smart, I, I guess it would have to be a smarter thief. You know, your, your less educated thief is probably still going to just go after the hardware. But, you know, somebody who's really trying to target a business, they don't know what they have necessarily. Well, for sure. And, and then also um, think about Silicon Valley. There's a certain amount of um, uh, th there's a motivation to embarrass sometimes. Like we've seen several incidents where they're not they're not trying to uh, ransom. They're not trying to steal data. They find a laptop in a Starbucks and they take advantage of that to publish things to embarrass the company. Um, and that's real damage. Like even though there's not a not an individual motive for that attacker. That's a yeah. that's a scary scenario, especially if, if like like Cohesity, um, my previous company was Splunk. If you are positioning yourself as a security company, those situations are embarrassing. Yeah, my my most my famous you know act of maliciousness, I would say, was you know any anytime somebody didn't leave their computer locked, I would always send them an email to themselves, run themselves, and let them try to figure out how it happened. But you know <laughs> you have to play games every once in a while. So let's talk. Uh, let's talk uh, quickly because we're, we're we're coming to the twenty minutes we have. But there's a lot of things you can do to defend against it, and, and things you can do. And we always we've talked about defense in depth for years. I think that that conversation is coming back full yeah. circle. Um, sure. But what is a lot of the things that you recommend or you talk about in your in the CISO circles that you have to do to to get past the data exfiltration problem now? Yeah, it, it, the the thing that's kind of uh, interesting or at least interesting to me is the fundamentals, the fundamentals of security hygiene that we've been practicing for years or we should have been practicing for years is still the, the best steps that we could, that will give you the most significant progress in your security posture, making sure that your data is encrypted in transit at rest, your backups are encrypted, making sure that you've got a solid patching program and you're patching vulnerabilities, uh, high and critical vulnerabilities within uh, aggressive timeframes. That really has a significant impact. And it's still amazing to me how many companies are not um, committed to those basics, those fundamentals. There's some really cool things out on the marketplace that helps um, increase your security posture. But if you're not doing those things, you're just kind of throwing pebbles at the, at the problem. So my, my famous line, and, and I think you always agree with it, and I, I will clean it up, but I always say, you know, patch your stuff is usually different word than stuff when I do presentations live and it's not being recorded, but it's still true, right? I mean, you still have to, it, it's, it's funny that you say fundamentals because, uh, 
you know, I've been a fitness guy for a long time. And when you do fitness stuff, it's always about fundamentals. It's about building your foundation. It's about, you know, doing the same things that are the fundamental exercises right. to for stretching and flexibility. So, you know, there's parallels to all that, but it's, it's amazing that you still brought that back to, you know, you've got to do the things you've been doing <laughs> in addition yeah. to a hundred other things. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that, that level of vigilance is, is certainly critical. Well, I, I definitely don't envy the position you're in <laughs> some days. Uh, and, and, and as you've said, you know, we get along really well, but I'm one of your worst enemies because, you know, I, I, I'm one of the guys you got to worry about sometimes because we do find those vulnerabilities, but we do, guys like me, bring them forward to you. We say, hey, you know, we found this thing. We found this kind of, it doesn't look right. You know, maybe you want to investigate. Um, last yeah, question. But, or, well, ahead. before you get to this, but think about the value of that, right? Like historically, the feedback that a, that a security organization would get would be through an audit, through a SOC 2 audit or through uh, ISO, HIPAA type of an audit. And what they're doing is they're auditing the definition of the control against the deployment. What you're doing is you're actually testing the controls or the security posture that I think we've achieved in real world situations. It's hard to replicate that. That's why you see you know, uh, red teaming and, and things along those lines. But having that level of perspective on the actual security posture is so valuable. Well, and, and I'm glad to help, you know that. Um, so last question, and, and this one's gonna kind of wrap it all up, and this is one of the tougher ones, and, and I'm, I didn't surprise you with it, we talked about it ahead of time, but you could do all of these things. You could do, have your fundamentals, you could be doing all of your, your lockdowns, you could be inspecting traffic, you could be doing everything. And because you're using Cohesi, for example, this could be a real world experience, you, and we have customers who have had this. You may recover and you may not pay the ransom, but some of the data may still have been exfiltrated before you caught it. And I believe you and I work in real world, right? Not right, everything right. Is, is unicorns and rainbows. And this is a tough thing for me to ask you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna set the expectation that whatever you're gonna say is your opinion. It's not you know, you, you know, something that Cohesity says, so I'll take care of that legal part for you. But how should people approach that? Because I do think that is a realistic, uh, is a realistic scenario, especially for somebody running our product that can recover and not pay the ransom. For sure. Well, so one of, it's, it's a decision that each individual company needs to make for themselves because there is a set of variables that need to be considered. The type of business they're in, the size of the, the size of the impact, the type of data that was exfiltrated. And so deciding whether or not to pay, the, to pay a ransom, deciding do you, do you have cybersecurity insurance, how much do you have, it really should be based on the level of risk and uh, that's created by the security posture and the potential impact. The, the thing that I really think is critical, though, is that we need to make those decisions before the event happens. So we need to be thinking through those different scenarios and understand what our thresholds are, when we'd be willing to pay the ransom, in what situations would we be, be willing to pay a ransom if, we, if that is an option for us, um, what it, what, how much cybersecurity insurance do we need based on the level of risk or expo exposure that we think we have. Because if you're trying to make those decisions at the time of as you're managing a breach, time is everybody says time is of the essence, but it so is when we're talking about the impact from a breach perspective. So anything that delays your ability to respond and make those decisions, and these are going to be hard decisions to make even without the urgency of a breach on top of it, is is really, really um, important. It's 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 critical. It's as critical as running through the scenarios themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we've hit our time and Brian, I swear to God, one of these days you and I have to do this on a real stage because <laughs> you and I could do a one hour just conversation about these things because you stay stuff and I just want to go off on another tangent. <laughs> um, and I've pulled a lot of your time in the past couple of weeks to do these uh, for different events. So uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed this 20 minute presentation and conversation around uh, these two issues and uh, be sure to check out the Cohesity website and we'll see you on the flip side.